The Consulting Success Podcast is powered by the Clarity Coaching Program. If you'd like to work directly with the Consulting Success team and receive personal coaching and support to optimize and grow your consulting business, marketing, and revenue, visit consultingsuccess.com to find out more and apply. Welcome to the Consulting Success Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Zapersky. In this podcast, we'll dive deep into the world of elite consultants, where you'll learn the strategies, tactics, and mindset to grow a highly profitable and successful consulting business. Hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky, and welcome back to another episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. Today, I'm very excited to have Stacey Ennis joining us. Stacey, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I can't wait for this conversation. Yes, this will be fun. So Stacey, you are a consultant, an author. Uh, you're also the, the CEO and founder of the Nonfiction Book School. Uh, you train leaders at Starbucks, the Boeing Company, Intuit, and many other organizations. And you're also an avid traveler who's uh, moved around the world with your family. And we we're just talking about that uh, before we hit record here. So we share a lot of kind of, uh, I think, similarities in terms of the, the passion and love of the world and traveling. Why don't we start there? I'd love to kind of hear how has your travels shaped both your personal life and how you think about business and the work that you do? You know, I was born and raised in Boise, Idaho in the US. And it's an amazing town, but it's very homogenous and it's very... I felt like my life was very much like laid out ahead of me from the examples that of other people in my community that I saw. And when my husband and I moved to the first of our, you know, four countries that we lived in outside of the U S I feel like I just went through a complete change as a person challenged mindsets that I held uh, beliefs that I held learned how to be courageous and take risk and, grow and be uncomfortable, you know, moving to a country where you don't speak the language is a very uncomfortable thing. We lived in an area of of Santo Domingo where most people didn't speak English. We weren't in a tourist area. So that was just grew. I just grew so much from that. And I, I think also realized how confined my world was. I think the thing I'm so grateful for before that is that my world, I had so many worlds opened up to me through reading. I was a voracious reader as a child. And so I think something about that and the exploration I did on the page did help me when we moved to this new setting. You know, a lot of people are not successful living in new countries. They are gone within a few weeks to a couple of months. And I think the reason that we were able to stay and really immerse in the culture and then in the next culture in Vietnam and then the next culture in Thailand and now in Portugal is that we were, I felt like an, I was open and willing to, to try something new and to embrace a new culture. And being open also means being willing to be changed, even in a very core way. So I very much shifted just so much. I mean, every, I, I think like every aspect of who I am as a person, my values remained, but I think the way that I saw the world was just flipped in that, that first experience living abroad. And for the, the consultants and you know, people that are listening and joining us right now who are thinking, you know, I'd love to spend more time traveling and maybe living different places while I'm running my business, what stands out to you is like, are there maybe one or two things that you think, oh, like you definitely need to pay attention to this. Like this is one area that is a hundred percent a must consider or an area to prepare for any kind of like advice around if you're going to be successful in traveling and running a business at the same time, these are the things that you, you need to look for or pay attention to. Definitely. I think one thing that we've that we know about ourselves is that there's kind of two versions of people that do this abroad thing. One is the kind of digital nomad that moves a lot and moves from place to place and is able to travel and bring their work with them and still be really productive. That is not me. It is not our family. We need a lot more stability than that. And so then there's this other kind of person that either travels long-term, slow travel where they're in a place for you know six months to a year, even three months, or they move like we have. And that is more about immersion, I think, than trying to fit a lot of things in or stay in places for short periods of time. So I think learning that about yourself and understanding how travel impacts you and sometimes whether the ideal that you have is actually how you function best, 
I had an ideal of moving and kind of doing the nomad thing before I had kids, of course. And I just learned about myself that I prefer slow travel. I prefer to be in a place and I prefer to get into the community. So that has been huge in just adjusting to a model of living and working that works for me. And I would say the same for anybody that aspires to do something similar. Yeah. We're going to get into writing and storytelling and more on on the business side in a moment. But if we go a little bit further on, on this topic... Have, have you made any changes or kind of conscious decisions, any kind of best practices when it comes to thinking about how to structure your business or run a successful business while you are living in different places, right? Like you don't have one home. I mean, you have a home base while you're there, but you do move around and you're moving in also in different time zones. So have you, have you made any conscious changes to your business, to your business model that you feel give you an advantage or an upper hand? when it comes to being able to, to kind of travel and run a business at the same time? I think a, a couple of things. One, my team is dispersed across time zones. So I have a couple of people here in Portugal, some people in the US, which has been huge because we have what's nice. We have you know people that are available while I'm, I'll, I'll give something out and wake up to it being done, which is great. We also have team available to respond to client inquiries or other things that come up. So that's been great. I think from a, just a self-management perspective and a self-leadership, I should say, knowing other people that do similar things to what I do, one of the great risks is that you're just kind of always working and you want to, you feel like you need to accommodate your client's schedule, meaning that you're having calls just way too late into the day. And so, you know, at first I did that when we lived in Thailand, I would be up for 6 a.m. calls and I would take 10 p.m. calls and I would just be so exhausted and really my quality of life suffered. I was also traveling all the time. I was traveling internationally, you know, every month or so, sometimes every six weeks, but I was gone for one to two weeks at a time. I remember there was a day I came back from Vietnam, was home for 12 hours, flew to the U.S., worked in multiple U.S. states flew home. That's 24 hours one way to the the US and then 24 hours back. And so when we moved to Portugal, I just decided that, you know, if I'm going to work with clients, that they need to understand my availability. And I'm not going to show my best as my best self for them if I'm exhausted or I'm missing dinner with my family consistently. So what that has meant is that I only take calls three days a week and I only take them in about a three hour period during those three days. Once in a while, you know, it edges a little out if I have to, but I think that is one of the greatest challenges that people face when they're working across time zones. And it is like a boundaries thing. And I think also clients, if you give them that ahead of time and they understand how this relationship will work, and you can find something that still works for them and works for you. It's actually mutually beneficial. I think they appreciate that, that you want to show up with excellence and not drain yourself and be present for them. I think that's a really great point because that mindset and kind of practice uh, and behavior can, can be applied to people who aren't traveling or just, you know, just in our everyday lives, right? Like setting those boundaries. I think one of the biggest hesitations that people have when they're considering that or kind of going through that, that themselves is the fear of saying no to clients or, or turning away business. How did you grapple with that? Because I'm sure, well, I shouldn't say I'm sure, but I I would guess that there was maybe some consideration at one point or another of, well, if I'm only working three days, if I'm only taking calls three days a week, if I'm only going to take calls during this block of time, there's going to be people in, let's say, you know, the Pacific time zone in North America that may not want to do a call earlier in the morning for whatever reason. So I'm going to have to turn away that, that potential business. How did you think about that? And what was your kind of mindset and and process to be able to arrive at like the decision that, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to stick to this, even if it means that I'm potentially turning away some business. Well, you're right. And it also means that if people want to have a, an initial call, they have to wait, right. Instead of getting it the same day or the next day, sometimes it's the next week or in a couple of weeks. But I will say that for me, it's so much more important to have balance. And I firmly believe that clients who are a good fit will respect that 
you know, you're in demand and that in, and actually I think that that plays to your benefit as well when you're not just like instantly available. The other thing I'll say is I'm not doing all the work myself, right? So I have a team, for example, I have a ghostwriter on my team who writes books for clients. And so most of the calls, I don't actually have to be on those. I'm on the initial strategic calls. I'm available as an advisor along the way, but she's in their time zone. So we, it works in that way that like, if I can't make a call and it's not necessary for me to be there, somebody on my team can take the call. So that has made it a little easier too. Yeah. Fantastic. I want to, hopefully everyone's paying attention to this and kind of thinking about how does this apply to some aspect of your life and business right now? And, and really making sure that your actions and your behavior aligns with your, with your values and communicating those values. And I think you're so right that as you communicate, like we'll talk about storytelling in a moment here, but uh, if you're clear on what your values are and what's important to you, and you put that out into the world and really communicate it and stand behind it, you're going to attract clients that also share those same values and, and respect those values. And there'll be some people likely that won't share those values and they'll, you know, they're going to want to get on a call right away, or they're going to want to talk to, they're not going to want to make those adjustments to fit into your, your schedule, but that's probably likely going to be a client that's going to be a pain in the backside or the one that you're just going to have trouble with because there's some, you know, mismatch there. There's not a good alignment and good fit. So I think that's a great point. Let's talk about writing because that's a lot of what, what you do with your clients and kind of, you know, the, the focus of a lot of your work. What impact have you seen writing has and or can have for a professional, for someone, you know, a consultant and professional services, really just anyone in general who has expertise? What are kind of results and what's the benefit of somebody thinking about writing, whether it's articles or a book, but just writing more and producing more, more content and sharing more of their, their knowledge or story or expertise? So there's two ways that I think about this. One is external benefits, and these are the more obvious ones. And then there's internal benefits. And those are less tangible, but I think even more important. So we think about external, externally, what does writing a book or writing content of some kind do for you? Well, it positions you as an expert. If, if, when you're writing about something, you're establishing your expertise in that area. A book, of course, is kind of the pinnacle of that, that content anchor of expertise, a well-written book, I should say, because that does matter. It opens the door to keynote opportunities. It drives potential clients your direction who are, you know, getting this book in their hands. Um, So there's a lot of benefits that we all, I think, are well known about writing a book. What I think is especially interesting for consultants is the internal journey of authorhood. And I know you've written books, so I'm sure you can chime in on this as well. There is, and I'm going to speak to book writing specifically because that's the most profound, but you still get some of these, the same benefits in a smaller scale, writing other pieces of content. When you write a book, there is a forced distillation of your ideas. There is a a clarity. There is a journey that you have to go on through that writing process to be clear in not just the, what you're writing at the sentence level, but how are you even structuring your ideas for consultants specifically? What I find with my clients and students is that they're able to develop new frameworks, new systems, new ways of organizing their ideas and how they work with their clients. And then often that leads into new revenue streams, like um, a specific consulting program that you're designing and executing or a course or, you know, a revenue could be speaking engagements, but that's built off of this clarity. The other aspect of that is this new confidence that you find in that journey because you have that depth of exploration. In most of our day-to-day lives, we maybe spend five minutes in silence, if that, you know, silence being no input, we're not listening to something. We're not reading something. We're not scrolling something. When you're writing, you are forcing focus for a long time. And you are, if you're doing it right, you are shutting off all the other distractions and you're going within yourself to, again, find that clarity and really think like to think that is really powerful. That's why I'm so passionate about book writing. Yeah. There's these great benefits that we all know about, but there's that journey that I have yet to find another thing that has so much power for an individual to arrive on the other side 
really cha- transformed. Right. So I know you, you mentioned that in your case, when you were younger, you, you were very like a, a voracious reader. And I'm sure that that helped to kind of influence how you think about writing and, and how you, you write yourself. But for those who maybe don't feel that confident in terms of their writing skills or just often kind of encounter like that, the writer's block, are there exercises or is there a book or a resource that helped you that if somebody wanted to just kind of you know go through or or read more about to that what you just might be helpful for them to become a better writer yes absolutely so just on a really practical just touch point it is much more important that you show up with consistency and frequency than the actual amount of time that you sit down and write so for example if somebody is struggling with writer's block and they're only trying to write once a week or every month or every two weeks, what I would recommend rather than sitting down for that hour and like shaking your fists at the sky in frustration, set aside 15 minutes, four days a week and and spend that time writing. There's actually really good scientific research that shows that we can train our brains through habit building to tap into creative flow consistently. So it's really more about that frequency and consistency and also the habits. There's some specific habits that you should build around your writing time. For example, you drink a big glass of water and you stretch and then you meditate for five minutes and then you sit down. That could be an example. So those habits before and then that consistency frequency, same time. It's all really important. As far as forming a new writing habit. I'm actually just about to release a writing habits course that helps. It's a five-day course that helps you just in that short period of time, very efficiently, rather than, you know, this big, long multi-week course, very efficiently established new writing habits. That'll be on my my website, stacyannis.com. But I think most important is really focusing on the habit building. And also just remembering that this is a skill that you can develop, right? It's not like magic. <laughs> it's a skill. I totally agree with that. I mean, I remember reading, I think it's On Writing by Stephen King, right? Yes. Um, Love talks, that book. Yeah. Like his, yeah. his whole thing was the habit of, and whether he was playing loud music or whatever, but like, you know, I think very early in the morning, just sitting down and you hear this over and over from anyone that's written you know, at least one book, if not multiple books that... They just tend to to spend time every single day, and even if it's just a little bit that that you actually produce, you tend to actually produce a lot more because of that habit that, that you're creating. And just the act of showing up and spending that time tends to overcome the the hesitation or the quote unquote you know writer's block that so many people encounter. So I think that's really good advice, uh, and that's probably the area that most people struggle with is just the fact of actually like s- sitting down at their computer or with pen to paper or whatever whatever it is. But just making that time to do that consistently because uh, they're so worried about like, well, I don't have anything good to say, or I'm not sure what I should actually write today. Uh, and so then they don't, they don't sit down and then they don't make progress. So I think that's really, really good advice that, that you're providing there. Is, is there anything else for, in terms of like a, the writing process for, for a book? I mean, I know this is a pretty detailed subject and you, know, you go into a lot, a lot more on that with, if we had more time. But in terms of like a high level perspective, if somebody's thinking about how should I even start structuring my book? Is there a specific structure that you would recommend that people think about in terms of like a nonfiction book? If I can just, I'll step it back just a layer um, and then I'll answer that question if that's okay. So a lot of times what I find that people do wrong when they're writing books is they just kind of rush into it. They'll, They'll maybe sketch out a very loose outline or maybe they just sit down and start writing. And that is just not the right process to take. Instead, what I really recommend is that people spend significant time in the ideation and the planning stages, which would include sorting out what structure you want to use for your book. When you think about structure of nonfiction books, there are three core structures. So we have have the big idea book, right? That's what we often think of as a thought leadership book. We have a how-to book, which is informative. It's more of a teaching, um, often very practical. And then we have a narrative uh, and this is more story led and this can fit into memoir and creative nonfiction as well, but it can also be a leadership book that's based on a story. Okay. So those can also get blended. So there's different 
it doesn't, they don't, they're not hard and fast categories, but I think starting with understanding where your book kind of fits uh, within those three categories and also considering what is your big vision for that book. And that's actually when you go into the ideation stage before you ever get into structure, you should be able to answer the question of what is this book a catalyst for? Like, where is this book taking me in my impact journey? For consultants, you need to be thinking about what grows out of this book. What is this book setting me up to do or to build or to create? It should, if it's a bit, if it's connected with your business or your thought leadership, growing thought leadership in any way, there should you should be able to answer that question. And that will help you also answer the question of how do I structure this book? Hey, it's Michael here, and we'll be right back to the podcast. But first, are you ready to grow, scale, and take your consulting business and marketing to the next level? If so, our Clarity Coaching Program may be a great fit for you. You'll work with our experienced team to set up a strategic plan for your business and coach you step-by-step step in areas like how to consistently attract more leads, develop a magnetic message that resonates with your ideal clients, strategically package and position your services, earn higher fees, win more proposals, and scale your business. To find out more about Clarity Coaching and apply, go to consultingsuccess.com and click on coaching. You mentioned that uh, one of the benefits of having a real book and, and a good book at that is that uh, it helps you to, to land, for example, keynote speaking opportunities. What have you seen with, you know, over the years for yourself or with clients that, that you've worked with? What does that look like? How do they actually go from, okay, I have my book ready now to landing a speaking engagement, landing a, a keynote opportunity? Is it as simple as just sending a book to a bunch of people? Like what, what's the process? What's the best practice around, okay, I have my book. How do I actually use this to, to land speaking engagements or to land new clients? When my most recent co-authored book, Growing Influence, came out in 2018, now I've since, I've also ghostwritten or written 16 other books, but this is one of, one of the, the books that I've, I've written. When that book came, came out in 2018, we really leveraged the power of PR. And I, this is one piece that anybody who's in the middle of writing a book or planning to write a book or launching a book, I, I highly recommend a good good PR. Now PR is like anything else. You can get like a hit and miss or total miss and you can waste a lot of money. But if you work with a really, really good PR firm that understands you and is bought into your mission, it can be one of the greatest investments. For us, for my co-author and I, what we found is that we got the right kind of placements in the right kind of publications that were giving us inbound keynote inquiries. And, and so that's really how we, I, I landed several keynotes actually after our book came out and also some really big training opportunities in companies to go in and train hundreds of people. So, and, and that specific one was a PR placement on hr.com for an article that led to somebody reaching out on that specific topic to get support within their company. So that has been a huge one. The other thing that I would say is that, you know, you can absolutely do the traditional, like reach out to different speaking conferences or, or other things. But what I've found over so many years of doing this is that the, I always want people to reach out to me. Right. And the, the PR piece is so powerful in getting the inbound requests versus like grasping at the air, trying to get somebody to give you <laughs> give you an opportunity. So you mentioned that you provide right training to larger organizations, and we mentioned some of those companies that you've worked with in the past. How do you currently think about the structure of of your business? Because it's almost like two two different businesses. You know, in terms of you have this corporate side, you also have this book writing side. Kind of walk me through like where do you spend most of your time, and and how do you manage these two different aspects or do you look at them as all part of one? Yeah, it's interesting. I'm sure anybody listening to this can relate to the phases of business and kind of exploring different ways of working that that's where you can really show up as your best self with excellence. So for me, I definitely have a lot of different ways that I work. And I personally, I prefer that. I find it a lot more interesting to not just have like one rote thing that I do. So I work one-on-one -on -one with clients who are writing their books. These are typically 
CEOs, founders, consultants, a lot of consultants, speakers or aspiring speakers, people that specifically the people that I love working with are, they have a a vision that the book is a catalyst for, like I mentioned earlier. I also have a team. So we ghostwrite books, a really fantastic writer on the team. And I'm involved in really the strategic um, approach to the book. So helping again, align that book with the big vision. Um, And then I, you know, I speak and train at different, especially different conferences. I've done a lot of trainings for Intuit and some other large corporations, specifically around messaging, telling your story and really that, that idea of like refining your message and showing up powerfully in the world. I would say it's different things, but they're all very connected. And sometimes there's phases where I'm doing more corporate stuff and there's phases where I'm running my programs and just kind of ebbs and flows. What's in terms of if you look at the, the overall business revenue and the breakdown of that, what percentage would be on the corporate side? What percentage would be on kind of the book one-to-one side? How does that break down? If I were to go back pre-COVID, the corporate side would be a larger percentage than it is today. I would say today it's probably in the 10 to 15%. And I have um, I have a program that I run that's probably in the 15% range. And then I'd say the bulk of our business revenue comes from one-to-one, both the coaching and the done-for-you services with my team for ghostwriting. Got you. And how about marketing? How, how have you approached marketing or like today, what's working for you most to, to get new clients, both on the corporate side and on the the one-to-one side? Yeah. It's funny. I've been in business 13 years this year and I used to brag about how I didn't do, I mean, I wasn't trying to brag, but really when I look back, I'm like, Oh, I thought it was so great. I don't do marketing, which is so silly. And now I reflect on that. I was completely doing marketing. I was doing content marketing. I just didn't realize that I was doing that. So I'm very consistent with my content. I publish to my email list every week. I have new content coming out all the time. Um, I have a podcast. I have a blog. What I would say has worked especially well for me is that I only create and then I hand off. What used to cause me a lot of grief (laughs) is that I would create something and it would just sit in my computer because all the next steps had to be completed. I had to proofread it. I had to you know, publish it. I had to do all the little things, but now I have a really smooth content system within our, within the business that I get to really do that creation piece. So that's one thing content. I think personally content is queen, of course, given my uh, area of work. The other thing is I invest in PR. So I just, I'm on pause right now, but I go through kind of PR campaigns depending on the time of year. And I have a marketing person that I work with specifically on analytics and conversions. So that's not my area of expertise. So I hire support in those areas. And then I have somebody on my team who does social organic social media. And I get to show up again and just create. And I don't have to have that pressure of all the other things that need to be done. So taking taking out those like things that stressed me out has helped a lot with being able to just show up on a, and authentically create content. Yeah. Is there anything in your marketing that just works exceptionally well, maybe even better than you expected that it would when you kind of first thought about it? Yeah, I would definitely say my weekly email has surprised me with how much it resonates with people. I get so many responses every single week from people saying, I love your emails. I feel like I'm getting a personal email from you every week. You've really supported me on my journey. And that has been surprising because I I don't write the emails like you would think somebody would, in, you know, like a newsletter format or very like excessively polished. It's just a personal message that I send out to people on my list with some thoughts and reflections and encouragement. So that's been really cool. And I've really enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would when I, when I started building the list. Is there anything that you've done from a marketing perspective that just fell flat on its face that you maybe had high hopes for, uh, got excited about, and then rolled it out and just, it just didn't work? Yeah, definitely. I invested in some marketing strategy uh, last year, actually. And we're with a new person now. So she's listening. I'm not talking, I'm not talking about her. She's great. But we we invested in some marketing strategy building with a plan to also invest in the execution. 
And I think what we did wrong there was, and I would say I did wrong there, is that I tried to outsource too much of the, the marketing vision and strategy. And I wasn't, I needed to be more involved in shaping and really, I, I think I didn't provide a strong vision. And so when we went into this next engagement, I was a lot clearer around what my one thing is, what my vision for impact is, why I show up for clients and students. And that has really changed how I how I feel. I feel like our marketing is just so much more aligned and we have clear data and we're like, I think we're going to hit our target by end of year. So that's all. I think just being a little bit more hands-on than I was in the past. And how about your pricing strategy? So you've been in business now 13 years. How has your your pricing or approach to pricing changed over the years, if, if at all? Oh, yeah, it's definitely changed. I mean, I think one thing that I would say, you know, we're building out new revenue streams right now. I'm launching some new programs and products, or I should say courses and products. I'm really excited about, by the way. And so that's been interesting, learning how to price something that isn't a service. Because I've been a service-based business for most of my business, I'd say 10 of the 13 years, I was solely a service-based business. So it's been interesting just kind of learning that pricing strategy. I think like most early on, I was not charging enough for my, my time. But also when I reflect back, you know, I was 20... How old was I? 24. 23, 24, when I started my business. So, I mean, I couldn't really charge. I it, like I was building my value. What I wish I had done a little bit earlier was recognized my value when it was time to increase my prices. Instead, I think it took me a little longer than it should have. The other thing, of course, that I'm sure many of your listeners are transitioning through or have transitioning through, have transitioned through is value-based pricing. And it's not about the time that I put in, but it's about the value that I bring to my clients and students. And that's just such a... I made that shift several years back, but man, is it freeing to not have that tied to time and to really feel that it's about your value that you bring. Is there anything within that that you did that you found exceptionally helpful? Like in that process of shifting from hourly fees or thinking about time to thinking much more based on value and, and return on investment and more outcome based. Is there anything that like unlocked for you and just kind of really helped to, to get things working? It's interesting. I had a call once, this was probably seven years ago with a, an attorney uh, client and we were somewhere into our call and he said, I don't want to take up too much time on this because we only have 20 minutes left or something like that. Like it was so anchor. I could tell he was so nervous about the time that we were using because I was connecting it with ours. Right. And that conversation, I was like, that does not feel good to me or to him. I never want to have, I don't want anyone to feel that way. And I don't like feeling like if I have a thoughtful conversation with you, that's not directly tied to our business objectives that like, you're going to feel like we're wasting time. I didn't want that feeling again. So a couple of things. One is I increased my minimum time to work with me. So I used to go on a month by month, you know, people could kind of work with me month by month, or it was maybe two to three months at a time. And so I, I grew that out to a minimum of five months for engagements because I have data to show that that's the amount of time I need to work with people on their books for them to be successful. And then I also opened up access. So just we have with book coaching specifically, we have two calls a month, but you can reach out at any time. And I'm always happy to, you know, work through stuck points with you. I think my clients would say that I very much over deliver, but I also have a price point that, that helps me not have to take on tons of clients so that I can do that. And right. so you're charging premium well. fees and you're providing premium service, right? So you're, you're aligning exactly. that. That makes sense. When you think about, so you ha- you talked about your team, right? So it's not just you, you've built out a team in, in different aspects or areas of the business. When you think about your, your goals for the next 12 months, 24 months, kind of going into the future, and you think about growth and scaling, is there anything that you're currently doing that you feel is just critical to help you to scale or grow to that next level? For sure. Number one focus is reaching more people. So that would be audience growth. And that metric is so important because for, especially as we're building out 
programs and products to support people. We need to reach more people to be able to grow that part of the business. So that is really our our huge, huge focus. And that's what we're looking at. We're always looking at the data. We're always analyzing what's working, what's not working. What do we start? What do we stop? How how, how do you sort of interrupt? How do you measure that? Is that just number of people coming to your website or building like number of people joining your email list? How do you measure that specific metric? Yeah. So I mentioned I have a marketing person that does analytics and conversions. So she's analyzing the data. I'm not analyzing the data and she's coming back. And, you know, for example, uh, we had a launch earlier this year. I have a program called Nonfiction Book School that I run. It's a live program. I am launching it as a course soon, but I run it live once a year. And so we did a bunch of different ad sets. And what we found was that on LinkedIn to acquire somebody for this specific thing I was doing, it was like $8.14. Whereas in this other ad we were running on Facebook, it was $1.20. However, then we have to look on the other side of that and see what's actually converting. So maybe this one costs $8, but it's actually leading to to a conversion. We're still kind of in the process of learning that because she just came on a few months back. But those are the kinds of things that she's analyzing and giving back to me. Um, Of course, we're looking at um, audience growth and drop, like when numbers drop. Losing an audience member is not necessarily a bad thing because you want to attract people that are a good fit and repel people who aren't. And then, of course, we're looking at social media growth, but more important than numbers is engagement. So we're looking at is what we're posting resonating with people? Are they commenting? Are they sharing? Are these leading to to conversations about potentially working with us? Those are all of all things that we are paying attention to. Fantastic. So Stacy, before we wrap up here, um, I'd love to know, I mean, you're, you, you're a world traveler, um, you have young kids, you're, you're running a business and a team. Uh, what are one or two things that you just do on a regular basis to maintain productivity, focus, high levels of uh, performance? Two core things I would say, uh, exercise. I exercise pretty much every day, I would say. Intensity varies, but about, you know, 45 to minutes to an hour a day and longer on the weekends. That's so important. And then the other thing in my schedule is I build consistent discretionary time. So discretionary time is simply focused time on things that matter. That could be strategy building. It could be writing. But the key is that I don't check email, social media, any screens that I, I try to go to all screens until 11 every day. And so from eight to 11 is my discretionary time. And then I open the Pandora's box of email at about 11 every day. And I check email about twice a day. So that just helps me maintain my, my focus and just be able to show up and be really productive for that eight to eight to 11 every day. And in the last six months, what's a, uh the best or um, just a book that you've really enjoyed either reading or, or listening to could be fiction, nonfiction is anything that you've, you've really enjoyed. I would say there's so many, I'm actually, although I work in the nonfiction world, I'm a huge, I just consume all the fiction. It's especially because I work in nonfiction. Most of the books that I read are fiction. And then I'm always reading like eight nonfiction books, which I think is pretty common for a lot of people. I'm just kind of like in and out of them. One book that I loved, which wasn't in the sex last six months, but not too much further. So I'm going to mention it. Yeah, there's a book called uh, Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. It is so good. I just love that book. And everybody who's read it on my recommendation has messaged me and said, Thank you. it's Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. Okay. So, I've never heard of it, but I will okay. <laughs> I'll mark that down. We'll try and uh, yes. do that in the show notes as well. Uh, and then Stacy, so... Uh, StacyEnnis.com. That's home uh, to everything good that people should check out. Anything else that we didn't, uh, any, any any other resource or website that we should be mentioning, or is that the, the main one that people should be going to? Yeah, I have a hidden page on my website, um, which has a bunch of free resources. So if you go to StacyEnnis.com slash resources, I think I have at least seven really detailed free guides on there, all about book writing, building your thought leadership, so it's a really, it's like a hidden gem that, you know, not everybody sees unless you listen to a podcast or hear it somewhere. Um, and then my nonfiction book school program, you can find details about that at nonfictionbookschool.com. 
All right. We'll have that linked up in the show notes. Stacy, uh, thank you again so much for coming on and uh, sharing some of your, your journey and your experience and, and skills, with, skills with us here today. Thanks, Michael. This is such a great conversation. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. For more episodes and to subscribe, rate, and leave a review, head on over to iTunes. And if you'd like to develop consistent lead flow and a highly profitable consulting business, learn more about our coaching programs at consultingsuccess.com.